Lesson 10 The Last Days Sabbath Afternoon August 31 The disciples, also misled by the teaching of the rabbis, shared the popular expectation of an earthly kingdom. They could not comprehend the movements of Jesus. They had been perplexed and troubled that he made no effort to strengthen his cause by securing the support of the priests and rabbis, that he did nothing to establish his authority as an earthly king. A great work was yet to be accomplished for these disciples before they would be prepared for the sacred trust that would be theirs when Jesus should ascend to heaven. Yet they had responded to the love of Christ, and though slow of heart to believe, Jesus saw in them those whom he could train and discipline for his great work. And now that they had been long enough with him to establish, in a measure, their faith in the divine character of his mission, the way was prepared for an avowal of the principles of his kingdom that would help them to comprehend its true nature. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 3. Acts of generosity and benevolence were designed by God to keep the hearts of the children of men tender and sympathetic and to encourage in them an interest and affection for one another in imitation of the Master, who for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. The law of tithing was founded upon an enduring principle and was designed to be a blessing to man. Reflecting Christ, page 270. It is the motive that gives character to our acts, stamping them with ignominy or with high moral worth. Not the great things which every eye sees and every tongue praises does God account most precious. The little duties cheerfully done, the little gifts which make no show and which to human eyes may appear worthless, often stand highest in His sight. A heart of faith and love is dearer to God than the most costly gift. It was this unselfish spirit and childlike faith that won the Savior's commendation. Lift Him Up, page 88 Who can question that we are living in perilous times? When Christ portrayed the destruction of Jerusalem, He looked down the ages and included in His description the still more awful destruction of the world. And He declares, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew chapter 24 verses 37 to 39. In his teaching, Christ has given lessons of great value in regard to the last days. Oh, that men and women would learn their danger before it is everlastingly too late! The Publishing Ministry, pages 280 and 281. Sunday, September 1. Two Little Coins in the Offering. The poor widow who cast two mites into the treasury of the Lord showed love, faith, and benevolence. She gave all that she had, trusting to God's care for the uncertain future. Her little gift was pronounced by our Savior the greatest that day cast into the treasury. Its value was measured not by the worth of the coin, but by the purity of the motive which prompted her. God's blessing upon that sincere offering has made it the source of great results. The widow's might has been like a tiny stream flowing down through the ages, widening and deepening in its course and contributing in a thousand directions to the extension of the truth and the relief of the needy. The influence of that small gift has acted and reacted upon thousands of hearts in every age and in every country. As the result, unnumbered gifts have flowed into the treasury of the Lord from the liberal, self-denying poor. And again, her example has stimulated to good works thousands of ease-loving, selfish, and doubting ones, and their gifts also have gone to swell the value of her offering. Reflecting Christ, page 268. The Savior called his disciples to him and bade them mark the widow's poverty. Then his words of commendation fell upon her ear. Of a truth I say unto you, 
that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. Tears of joy filled her eyes as she felt that her act was understood and appreciated. Many would have advised her to keep her pittance for her own use. Given into the hands of the well-fed priests, it would be lost sight of among the many costly gifts brought to the treasury. But Jesus understood her motive. She believed the service of the temple to be of God's appointment, and she was anxious to do her utmost to sustain it. She did what she could, and her act was to be a monument to her memory through all time, and her joy in eternity. Her heart went with her gift. Its value was estimated not by the worth of the coin, but by the love to God and the interest in his work that had prompted the deed. Lift him up. Page 88. God designs that the exercise of benevolence shall be purely voluntary, not having recourse even to eloquent appeals to excite sympathy. God loveth a cheerful giver. He is not pleased to have his treasury replenished with forced supplies. The loyal hearts of his people, rejoicing in the saving truth for this time, will, through love and gratitude to him for this precious light, be earnest and anxious to aid with their means in sending the truth to others. The very best manner in which to give expression to our love for our Redeemer is to make offerings to bring souls to the knowledge of the truth. The plan of redemption was entirely voluntary on the part of our Redeemer, and it is the purpose of Christ that all our benevolence should be free will offerings. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 413. Monday, September 2. Not one stone on another. The disciples had been filled with awe and wonder at Christ's prediction of the overthrow of the temple, and they desired to understand more fully the meaning of his words. Wealth, labor, and architectural skill had for more than forty years been freely expended to enhance its splendors. Herod the Great had lavished upon it both Roman wealth and Jewish treasure, and even the emperor of the world had enriched it with his gifts. Massive blocks of white marble of almost fabulous size forwarded from Rome for this purpose formed a part of its structure, and to these the disciples had called the attention of their master, saying, See what manner of stones and what buildings are here? Mark chapter 13 verse 1. To these words Jesus made the solemn and startling reply, Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Matthew chapter 24 verse 2 The Great Controversy, pages 24 and 25 As the disciples were gathered about the Savior upon the Mount of Olives, they asked, When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. The future was mercifully veiled from the disciples. Had they at that time fully comprehended the two awful facts, the Redeemer's sufferings and death, and the destruction of their city and temple, they would have been overwhelmed with horror. Christ presented before them an outline of the prominent events to take place before the close of time. His words were not then fully understood, but their meaning was to be unfolded as his people should need the instruction therein given. The prophecy which he uttered was twofold in its meaning. While foreshadowing the destruction of Jerusalem, it prefigured also the terrors of the last great day. The Great Controversy, page 25. Jesus said, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. All this the Christians suffered. Fathers and mothers betrayed their children, children betrayed their parents, friends delivered their friends up to the Sanhedrin, the persecutors wrought out their purpose by killing Stephen, James, and other Christians. Through his servants, God gave the Jewish people a last opportunity to repent. He manifested himself through his witnesses in their arrest, in their trial, and in their imprisonment. Yet their judges pronounced on them the death sentence. 
They were men of whom the world was not worthy, and by killing them the Jews crucified afresh the Son of God. So it will be again. The authorities will make laws to restrict religious liberty. They will assume the right that is God's alone. They will think they can force the conscience which God alone should control. Even now they are making a beginning. This work they will continue to carry forward till they reach a boundary over which they cannot step. God will interpose in behalf of his loyal, commandment-keeping people. The Desire of Ages, pages 629 and 630. Tuesday, September 3, The Abomination of Desolation Jesus declared to the listening disciples the judgments that were to fall upon apostate Israel and especially the retributive vengeance that would come upon them for their rejection and crucifixion of the Messiah. Unmistakable signs would precede the awful climax. The dreaded hour would come suddenly and swiftly. And the Savior warned his followers, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 and 16, and Luke chapter 21, verses 20 and 21. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign should be seen, those who would escape must make no delay. Throughout the land of Judea, as well as in Jerusalem itself, the signal for flight must be immediately obeyed. He who chanced to be upon the housetop must not go down into his house even to save his most valued treasures. Those who are working in the fields or vineyards must not take time to return for the outer garment laid aside while they should be toiling in the heat of the day. They must not hesitate a moment lest they be involved in the general destruction. The Great Controversy, page 25 Prophets had wept over the apostasy of Israel and the terrible desolations by which their sins were visited. Jeremiah wished that his eyes were a fountain of tears, that he might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of his people, for the Lord's flock that was carried away captive. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 1 and chapter 13 verse 17. What then was the grief of him whose prophetic glance took in, not years, but ages, he beheld the destroying angel with sword uplifted against the city which had so long been Jehovah's dwelling place. From the ridge of Olivet, the very spot afterward occupied by Titus and his army, he looked across the valley upon the sacred courts and porticos, and with tear-dimmed eyes he saw, in awful perspective, the walls surrounded by alien hosts. He heard the tread of armies marshalling for war. He heard the voice of mothers and children crying for bread in the besieged city. He saw her holy and beautiful house, her palaces and towers given to the flames, and where once they stood, only a heap of smoldering ruins. The Great Controversy, page 21. We may know that if our life is hid with Christ in God, when we are brought into trial because of our faith, Jesus will be with us. When we are brought before rulers and dignitaries to answer for our faith, the Spirit of the Lord will illuminate our understanding and we shall be able to bear a testimony to the glory of God. And if we are called to suffer for Christ's sake, we shall be able to go to prison trusting in Him as a little child trusts in its parents. Now is the time to cultivate faith in God. Our High Calling Page 357. Wednesday, September 4. The Great Tribulation. The time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess, and which many are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. 
the most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. The wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short and his work of deceit and destruction reaches its culmination in the time of trouble. Satan will have power over those who have yielded themselves to his control, and he will plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. In the midst of the time of trouble, trouble such as has not been since there was a nation, his, God's, chosen ones will stand unmoved. Satan with all the hosts of evil cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Maranatha, page 275. As the condition of the church and the world was opened before me, and I beheld the fearful scenes that lie just before us, I was alarmed at the outlook. And night after night, while all in the house were sleeping, I wrote out the things given me of God. I was shown the heresies which are to arise, the delusions that will prevail, the miracle-working power of Satan, the false Christs that will appear that will deceive the greater part even of the religious world, and that would, if it were possible, draw away even the elect. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 114. From the destruction of Jerusalem, Christ passed on rapidly to the greater event, the last link in the chain of this earth's history, the coming of the Son of God in majesty and glory. Between these two events, there lay open to Christ's view long centuries of darkness, centuries for his church marked with blood and tears and agony. Upon these scenes, his disciples could not then endure to look, and Jesus passed them by with a brief mention. Then shall be great tribulation, he said, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For more than a thousand years, such persecution as the world had never before known was to come upon Christ's followers. Millions upon millions of his faithful witnesses were to be slain. Had not God's hand been stretched out to preserve his people, all would have perished. But for the elect's sake, he said, those days shall be shortened. The Desire of Ages, page 630. Thursday, September 5. The Coming of the Son of Man. He, Jesus, answered and said unto them, the Pharisees, I tell you, that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. A large portion of those who professed to be looking for Christ would be as forward as the Pharisees were to have the disciples silenced, and they would doubtless raise the cry, FANATICISM! And the disciples spreading their garments and branches of palm trees in the way would be thought extravagant and wild. But God will have a people on the earth, who will not be so cold and dead, but that they can praise and glorify him. He will receive glory from some people, and if those of his choice, those who keep his commandments, should hold their peace, the very stones would cry out. Early Writings, page 109. Christ is soon coming in the clouds of heaven, and we must be prepared to meet him, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We are now to accept the invitation of Christ. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. The converting power of God must be upon our hearts. We must study the life of Christ and imitate the divine pattern. We must dwell upon the perfection of his character and be changed into his image. No one will enter the kingdom of God unless his will is brought into captivity to the will of Christ. 
Heaven is free from all sin, from all defilement and impurity, and if we would live in its atmosphere, if we would behold the glory of Christ, we must be pure in heart, perfect in character through His grace and righteousness. Reflecting Christ, page 22. The exact time of Christ's second coming is not revealed. Jesus said, No man knoweth the day nor the hour. But he also gave signs of his coming and said, When ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. He bade them, as the signs of his coming should appear, Look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Since we know not the hour of Christ's coming, we must live soberly and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. His people are to preserve their peculiar character as His representatives. There is work for every one of them to do. The rich should bring their means, the honored their influence, the learned their wisdom, the poor their virtue, if they would be effective workers with God. They are to bring themselves into right relation with God, that they may reflect the light of the glory of God that shines in the face of Jesus Christ. The Signs of the Times, June 24, 1889. For further reading, Our High Calling, Sweetness of Self-Denial, page 99, and The Great Controversy, The Destruction of Jerusalem, pages 17 to 38.